أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First and foremost, I'd like to send our heartfelt condolences to our Imam, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, on the commemoration of our sixth Imam, Imam al Sadiq alayhi afdal al Salati wa Salam, in which we have commemorated it, inshaAllah, the first of three nights dedicated to the person that is the ocean of knowledge. The man that was attributed to delivering and exploring the school of thought that we have today. That's why we refer to it as the Ja'fari school of thought. And when we come forth and try to commemorate such a great man with the limited time that we have, when we first look at this great man, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, when we look at this great, great character, there's so many dimensions to his particular character we can explore. On the first level, we can look at Imam al-Sadiq and say, and look into his perspectives when the exploration of knowledge, that's one aspect. Another aspect we can look at is how is it that he could and managed to deliver the information which is the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Furthermore, how did he act under the tyrant of his time? And how can we act? Other people may come forth and say we can explore Imam al-Sadiq's life by analyzing the debates that Imam al-Sadiq had. As in, we know that Imam al-Sadiq, and we have a large collection of Imam al-Sadiq's teachings and Imam al-Sadiq's debates, wa alaykum wa rahmatullah, in which he debates the atheists, in which he debates the Christians, in which he debates the Jews, in which he debates other religions, whether man-made or came from a particular book. Now, taking that into perspective, now there's many people that come forth and want to know Imam al-Sadiq, and Imam al-Sadiq shouldn't be explored in three particular days. Imam al-Sadiq, we need months to explore this great man. But to deliver it, inshallah, in these particular three nights, I want to dissect three particular aspects of importance of Imam Sadiq's life to our life. Trying to explore particular questions that have been asked in the past. And especially for tonight's topic, we want to explore Imam Sadiq in one particular faculty in which he tries to allow us to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way that he has given us this life. What do I mean? People may come forth and ask, what is... Allah's purpose for us. Some people may come forth and ask, why has Allah created me? What is the parameters that I can be within? Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed me to do whatever I want? Has Allah already predestined everything for me? Has Allah already written when I am born that I will do A, B, C and D and my masir is either hellfire or heaven? Or do I have a freedom of choice? Is it one of the extremes? Or is it something in the middle? What are the different ideas? Because when we look at Imam al-Sadiq's life, we can, like we said, there's many aspects we can analyze Imam al-Sadiq's life. But Imam al-Sadiq, subhanAllah, every single Imam knows exactly what you're about to ask and they give you exact response that will suffice. I'll give you an example before we start the topic for tonight. There was a person I was reading today with Imam al-Sadiq, the person that knew that Imam al-Sadiq was a great debater. That's what he called him. This person's name was Abdul Malik. The narration says 
that this person, Abdul Malik, was wanting to know Imam al-Sadiq and wanted to go towards Imam al-Sadiq to debate him because he thought that he had a hujjah. He thought that he could have a chance debating the Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. So he goes towards Medina because everyone thought that what? Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq is usually in Medina. He goes, it was what? It was Hajj period. They've told him Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq is actually in Hajj. Go towards Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, over there you'll find him. And subhanAllah, this person goes towards Mecca. And Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, this is, this is how we want to analyze this pe these people and how they had knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled into them. And how he knew exactly what that person came for, what he wanted to know, and how to respond to that particular person. On the first level, this person comes, he doesn't know who Imam Sadiq is. He doesn't know what he looks like. Who his companions are. He goes around the Kaaba while the people are circulating the Kaaba. Imam Sadiq is one of the people that are going around the Kaaba in Tawaf. He bumps shoulders with Imam. Imam looks at him. Look at the perfection of the wording of the Imam. The Imam looks at him and says, What's your name? The person looks at Imam Sadiq. He says, They call me Abdul Malik. Oh, my name is Abdul Malik. Look at the response straight away of the Imam. He says, This Malik that you are a servant for, is he a king of the earth or the king of the heavens? Straight away. Doesn't leave anything to chance. Doesn't leave him to ask his question. Straight away, the man's thinking, How on earth did he, does he know that I wanted to ask this particular question? Does Allah exist or doesn't he? So Imam looks at him, whilst he's thinking, he says, let me finish my circumambulating and then I'll come towards you and answer your question. He finishes tawaf, he goes to that man, he comes towards him, he says, you have come to see me, is that correct? He says, yes. He says, you have questions for me? He says, yes. He says, in regards to the Lord, is it not the existence or the non-existence? The man replies, he says, yes. He says, let me ask you, look how the Imam, Imam replies before we go into the depth of the topic for today. The Imam replies by saying, have you gone to the very east of the world? The man says, no. He says, have you gone to the very west of the world? He says, no. He says, do you know that there are layers of this earth? He says, yes. He says, do you know if there's anything in these layers? He says, I'm not sure. But I don't think so. He says, have you been to the heavens and seen the layers of the heavens? He says, no. He says, then how can you deny something not knowing if it exists in these places that you haven't explored? How can you deny the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there is a creator, that there might be signs that will lead you towards the creator somewhere in this universe that's been created if you not you haven't even explored outside your premises or outside where you find comfort in straight away response the person doesn't even say, say anything he's responded before he's even started his argument that's the power of the imam that's the aspect of knowledge taken from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the essence of this topic for tonight is to look at, in perspective of the person that we commemorate for tonight, two particular aspects of the utmost importance in the modern day society. And I'll tell you why it has a significance. This aspect is balancing between predestination and free will. Now, inshallah, to explore the topic for today, we want to look at the extremes to define it. What is predestination? What is free will in its absolute what schools of thought agree with these concepts? And what does the school of thought of Ja'far al-Sadiq say about it? What's the Ja'fari school of thought say about the concept of predestination versus free will? Now let's take it into the concept. We have one extreme known as free will. They say this is an extreme of free will. And this is the opinion of the Mu'tazilites. Group come forth and they say everything Allah has created and he's left. There's a cycle in which Allah has created and He's left it. You have absolute free will in whatever you want to do. And they, that's how they come forth and say that, yes, this is why you will be given heaven or hell. Because you have absolute free will. Whatever you want to do, you can do. That's one opinion of the extreme. 
That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have anything to do with your life once you're created. The other extreme is the Ash'arites. What do they come forth and state? The Ash'arites say, no, everything Allah has predestined. If you go towards sin, Allah has already predestined it. If you go towards something which is righteous, that will allow Allah to, subhanahu wa ta'ala to be happy with you, with your actions, that is predestined. Because Allah willed it, then it will be. These are the two extremes. Now what's the problems before we go to the third opinion? If we take one of them, the Ash'arites, they say everything's predestined. Abu Hanifa was of the same opinion. He goes towards Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. He waits at the door of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Who comes out? Imam al kazim Four or five years of age, he comes out. Abu Hanifa wants to ask a question. He says, is your father home? He says, yes, but he's busy. Can I assist you? Look at the Ahlul Bayt. Never afraid to answer a question because they had the knowledge and they knew that they had the knowledge. He says, ask me. Maybe I can assist you. So Abu Hanif is probably thinking to himself, well, I'm going to ask him. He's going to go towards his father and bring an answer or something like that. He's thinking, how possibly can a four or five-year-old answer my question of jurisprudence? Of theology, of the existence of Allah, why we are created. Such depth. Now, he comes and he asks. He says, the sin. Look at how it intertwines with the topic for tonight. He says, a sin. If someone sins, is it because of the person? Is it because of Allah? Or is it because of Allah and the person that's sinning? So three choices. Imam looks and says, Straight away, he says, it can't be the first, it can't be two of those options. Straight away, they go towards nullification. He says, why? He says, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the heaven and the hell, hasn't he? Abu Hanifa says, yes, he's created the heaven and the hell. He says, then it's not right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, or you can say that Allah has a hand in the sin, and he punishes you, and he, well, ayyadu billah, is not punished. Because he has a hand in it, because he said what? It's either, Abu Hanifa says, it's either Allah by himself that does it, the idea of predestination. Either Allah and the person, or the person by himself. So the Imam, one word he said, one word answers the question of the person that the other people take as a school of thought. He says, Allah doesn't have anything to do with your sin. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be also, well, ayyadu billah punished. He says, therefore, it's only you that have sinned against Allah. Straight away, he takes it into perspective. And that's why when we have predestination, and the argument of predestination, the first and foremost is, if Allah has predestined everything, then where is the question of a heaven and the hell? As in, if Allah has predestined you to do something good or predestined you to do something bad, why is it that He has sent 124,000 prophets to tell you, do good, do good? Someone come forth and, and say what? That Allah has already made me do bad. There is no need for prophets. There is no need for someone to come tell me there's a heaven and a hell if Allah has already written it to be, isn't it? That's the argument that comes into perspective. But why has this argument been installed? Why has this argument come and taken its place in the Islamic books? I'll give you one of the greatest responses to this. Now imagine a tyrant. Imagine a person that's in charge. An Umayyad Khalifa or Abbasid Khalifa. Whoever came afterwards that took the Khilafah of Ahl al-Bayt. If someone comes forth and says this chair that you sit on. Belongs to the Ahl al-Bayt. They can straight away come forth and say what? They can straight away come forth and say, Well, don't have an argument with me. Have an argument with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He has already predestined it. That's the argument that they say. That's why it served them to have predestination as an idea to look into. And that's why it's creeped into Islam. That's one argument. So the heaven and hell is the first contradiction to predestination. The second of which is what? It assists the khalifas of the time. On the other scale, complete free will. It's 
straight away, it doesn't take any formation. It doesn't embody. Why? Because we can first and foremost reply, did you ask Allah to be created? As because they say everything's free will. Did you ask Allah to be created? They'll say no. It says, do you know when you will die? Or can you ask Allah that he kills you on this particular day? Or he takes your life on this particular day? Did you ask Allah that you want to be born towards these particular parents? Did you ask Allah for these calamities in your life? These blessings in your life? Straight away the answer is no. Therefore we have the opinion that what? Neither complete predestination is correct. Neither complete free will is correct. Then where do we stand? Because Islamically we have to know. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala view our actions? How is it that Allah has placed us on this earth? Has Allah predestined everything? Is everything free will? Let's go to our imams. What do they say? And inshallah, we want to explore it tonight. And at the end of it, we want to look at, can our actions change something that is predetermined or not? As in, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written that you die tomorrow, is there something that you can do to extend your life by years, by months, by days? And on the reverse angle, if Allah has written for your life to die in a hundred years, inshallah, is there something that you can do against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah will decrease your life? That's what we want to explore tonight. So on the first level, we go to our imams. When we want to look at the concept of predestination versus free will, Imam Sadiq, when they come towards him, they say, which one do we take? Because this argument arose in the time of Imam Sadiq. And it was explored in the time of Imam Sadiq. Now some people came forth to Imam Sadiq and said, tell us what your opinion is. Oh, Imam Sadiq. And Imam Sadiq says, look at the beauty of how he responded. The examples that he gives us towards our intellect. He says, lift one leg. One leg, lift it. So the person that's asking, he lifts one leg. He says, okay, I want you simultaneously that you have the one leg lifted to lift the other leg. So the person says, I'll, I'll fall over. That's impossible. He says, that's the example. Some things in your life, Allah has predestined. The others, you have free will. As in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't asked you that... Do, I, do you want me to create you or not? He has created you. He hasn't asked you to what parents to be born to. He has given you those parents. He has given you towards those parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to tell you, well, I'm going to take your life today or tomorrow. And that's one of the biggest signs. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, it's enough that in the remembrance of death that you can reform yourself. It's enough, the remembrance of death, to reform yourself, to recalculate, to return to Allah. It's enough, the knowledge of death. So, O oh, Imam, give us more examples. How can we understand this concept in a more depth? Abu Hanifa goes and he, and he says this, and it's so beautiful, the predestination versus free will. We know a person of the greatest of Imam Sadiq's companions. That when Imam Musa al-Kadhim was in the jails and he was offered the position to be a judge in the Khilafah of Harun Rashid. He goes towards the Imam, what do I do? I don't want to be a judge towards these oppressors. Imam writes him one letter. He writes him Jim. He writes it to two other people. Everyone explained it in their own manner and did what they thought what the Imam meant to them. Bahlul takes the jim and he took it as jim al junoon So he becomes or he pretends to be insane, yet he still gets the message of Ahlul Bayt across. I'll give you an example. From tonight, in this particular topic of predestination, Abu Hanifa had the opinion, three opinions. He said, first and foremost, I'm of the opinion that Iblis will not burn in hellfire. That's the first opinion of Abu Hanifa. Why? He says, because Iblis is made of hellfire. He says, what's your second opinion? He says, the second of op opinion is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the day of judgment, we will see him. Why? He says, because everything that exists can be seen. He says, the third, what's your third belief, Abu Hanifa? He says, the third belief and my third belief is that everything that is 
done is predestined. Everything that occurs has been predestined. So Bahlul, one of the students of the Imam, he's saying, let me teach this particular person some proper knowledge. He takes up a stone or a rock or a brick at the time, and he throws it at Abu Hanifa. It's a very known story, but let's take the gist of it that applies for tonight. He throws it, but Hanif is injured. He's hurt, even though Bahlul is looked at to be what? A person that's pretending to be a majnoon, or a person that's pretending to be insane. He takes him towards the courtroom. He says, I want you to prosecute him. Why? What has this person that's insane done to you? He says, he's thrown a rock at me, and I want you to prosecute him because I feel pain. Look at Bahlul, running around in his broomstick. He goes to the judge, he says, I didn't hit him. He says, but he's saying that you've hit him. We're going to take him because he's not insane, you're insane. He says, no, 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 hold on. Abu Hanifa, first and foremost, says, everything that can be seen, everything that exists can be seen. He says, Abu Hanifa says, he feels pain. He says, can he show me pain? Number one. Everything that exists has to be seen. Abu Hanifa says, he says, I can't show you pain, but I'm feeling it. He says, that's number one. He says, number two, what is it? He says, I've taken rock or clay. I've thrown it at clay and clay got hurt. He says, Iblis, he says, he won't be burnt in hellfire because he's made of fire. He says, I've taken clay, I've thrown it at clay and clay got hurt. That's the second argument. He says, then, but you've still hit him. He says, no, Abu Hanifa says everything that is done is already predestined. Therefore, your argument is not with me, the insane Bahlul. He says, your argument is with Allah, according to Abu Hanifa, because Allah is already predestined for me to hit him. That's the students of Imam al-Sadiq. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Therefore, we analyze that the Imams tell us that it's a notion of balance. Allah prede predetermines aspects of our life. And we have complete free will in other aspects of our life. Everything that we are given a cho choice in life, as in if we choose the path to take, which is God-fearing, or we choose the path that will be disobeying Allah, Allah hasn't predetermined that. That's already given with your free will to take that choice. That's the fine aspect that we have to take from tonight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing, yes. He knows what you will do. He knows what path you will take. Some people may come forth and say that it's very hard. I'll give you an example. If we go towards, let's say, on another level, and especially that we have youth here, let's say we play PlayStation. Let's say we play PlayStation. Now I've got the youth's attention. Let's play Xbox, PlayStation. Let's play FIFA, for example. We know if we play a particular opponent, he's going to choose a particular team. Is that analyzing the future? Is that knowing what decision you will make? No, but because he knows you so well, he knows that you're going to choose, for example, Real Madrid or Barcelona, isn't it? If you go towards something where you go and eat, some people know that your preferences is not this, your preferences is that. A normal human can tell you that you're going to choose this one. Based on your actions, let's take it to another level. Based on your actions, let's look at it in the reference point of Karbala. The people's actions that led them towards Karbala. When Imam Hussein, when people look at Karbala, it's, Karbala is one of the most amazing Glasses that we can look through because it defines every single point that we want to explore in religion and it applies in every single time and place. Some people may, f may come forth and say that Karbala happened a thousand four hundred years ago. How does it apply nowadays? Let's look at it nowadays in the concept of predestination versus free will. What did he do on the 10th of Muharram? Because some people come forth and say that Karbala, back then we say every land is Karbala, every day is Ashura. Every day we have to make the choice. Hur, what did he say? He was the leader of that army that stopped Imam Hussein. 
They came and saw him on the 10th of Muharram. They asked him, they said, Hur, if someone asked us who is the most valiant of our warriors, we would not hesitate to mention you. Why is it we've seen you in this state where you are fearful? What did Hur reply? How can we apply what Hur responded to our lives now? He says, I, Ukhayyur Nafsi, he says, I am differentiating myself. I am making the choice between hell and heaven. That's the choice that we have nowadays. He says, I've brought Imam Hussein here, but at my final moments, I am deciphering whether my actions will lead me towards heaven or will lead me toward hell. Omar ibn Sa'ad, same issue. He tells himself, he tells people, say, يَقُولُونَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ جَنَّةٌ وَنَارٌ وَغُلَّ يَدَيْنِ He says, فَإِنْ صَدَقُوا فِي مَا يَقُولُونَ إِنِّي أَتُوبُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ إِنْ He says, if they say that this is true, then I will repent to Allah. Someone may come forth and look at this particular person's life. He's been bribed. He's been given mulk al -ray. Imam says, you won't even reach that particular land. Let's look at their lives. If we look at their lives and the actions that they've taken, whether small or large, if they've always been choosing the wrong path, can you tell me when they come to the next decision? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows. They've been choosing wrong all their life. They haven't made an attempt to repent towards Allah. They haven't made an attempt to go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You and I can look at it and say, you know what, he's going to choose wrong again. It doesn't take a genius. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes and emphasizes that the greatest and the biggest door after the door of Imam Hussein is the door of Tawbah. The largest door to go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in your dying moments, we can go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A bit of an off skirt, but let's go back to this topic of predestination versus free will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you're going to do. But He knows you do it with your free will. That's the concept. That's... The dot point that we need to take from tonight. He doesn't force you to go there. He knows that you're going to go there with your free will. Now, to end tonight, we want to mention two points before we conclude for tonight. The first of which, is, it, is there anything that we have in religion that may extend our life? Allah's predestined that we die in a particular day. Is there something that can extend our life? Is there something that can decrease our life? Now when we look at the books of hadith, we look at Imam al-Sajjad alayhi afdal salati was salam when he is asked, and an incident happens between two people. He tells them, and look at this beautiful narration. He tells one of them, because of an incident that happened, it's enjoining relations and breaking relations. Someone when enjoining relations, he said to the man, because you've enjoined relations, Allah has increased your life by 30 years. How many years? 30 years. And he says to the other man, because you have dissociated with your blood relative, broken relations, Allah has minimized your life by 30 years. Therefore, we can conclude that because of our actions, this is one of the actions that may occur. Because of an action, Allah may change that which is written. Whether it be for the benefit or the opposite of that. Whether it's increasing our lifespan or decreasing. That's what we have to explore. How do our a'mal manifest? How do our a'mal affect our future? The generations to come. Because oft, more than often, we say to ourselves, we want to create a better place for our children to live in. When we have to focus, we want to build our children so they can live in that place. They leave the children aside. They leave all the youth aside building. However, look at the beauty of how, ma how many children we have here tonight. How many children are in the house of Imam Hussein tonight that are remembering the person that distributed the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. 
Now, someone may come forth and want to ask, how is it, or what example can we give or take that will allow us to understand predestination versus free will a lot better? I've explored many different aspects. Now, inshallah, this particular example I've given, I've given it on many occasions. But this particular example allows us to really look at the complete scope, not the, in its entirety, but the complete scope to our understanding. But I need everyone's concentration. I know I've taken much of your time. Inshallah, I'll conclude with this. So when someone asks you predestination versus free will, give them this example. And I give myself this example first to allow me to understand it first and foremost. I want to give you the example of the tree. The tree, as you know, when it first grows, and which is the most vital point of the tree, the growth. When it grows, it doesn't begin to branch out. When it grows, it grows solid. The roots come together. And when it grows, it grows in a single stem. Then, at a particular point, it begins to branch out. Now, take that into account that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us or writes a sin for us when we reach the sin of Bulugh. Imagine the tree, when it begins to branch out, that's when Allah begins His tests. That's when you have different choices to make, different routes to take. Take that as an example. When we have this, the tree, you can imagine, we have amazingly big trees, amazingly small trees, trees with only a few leaves, trees with an abundance of leaves. Now imagine the length of that tree and the smallness of that tree is in reference to the lifespans that people may have, whether it be two, three years and die after Bulugh, or whether they live to a hundred years, inshallah, everyone here lives. That's the example. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look how many different avenues and how many branches they have. How many different twigs that these branch out in. And imagine every single leaf on that tree is an end point which you can reach. Everyone with me till now? Every single leaf is an end point in which a person can reach. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every single leaf on that tree. وَمَا تَسْخُطْ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا He has knowledge of every single leaf that falls. Allah has knowledge. Now, Allah has given us the choice which branch to take, which leaf to go towards, in which pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have the free will to go whichever branch you want. That leaf that you end up in, is that leaf, that leaf which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it falls off the tree, will you go towards heaven? Or will that tree, when, it, when that leaf falls and you reach that destination, will you go towards hellfire? That's what we have to take from tonight, inshallah, brothers and sisters. And I end on this note with this particular example. And I want to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to understand in more depth the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. We want to understand in more depth the essence of Ahl al-Bayt, the essence of their teachings. We want to take what they have taught and try as best as we can and as much as we can and not only to put it into our lives but also to distribute this knowledge, to give it to our friends, to our families, to our siblings and allow them to come with us. Be like how the Prophet of Islam says, be like water, purifying every single person around you. Gaining them, getting them closer towards the Ahlul Bayt, closer towards the message of Allah. We pray to Allah with a Fatiha, but before it, three of you allow the salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.